Hey, this is Nicholas. Let's talk about herbs that release the exterior, and specifically about the category warm acrid herbs that release the exterior. So the first thing we want to know is, when would we use herbs from this category, herbs that release the exterior? Well, no surprise, these herbs are used during an external attack, or we could say more specifically, when an external pathogen is lodged in the superficial layers of the body. When we say external pathogen, we're referring to the six evils, heat, cold, dampness, dryness, wind, and summer heat. So when one or more of these pathogenic influences attacks the body from the exterior, we use herbs that release the exterior to push it out. So how do these herbs work? What's their method of action? Well, these herbs work by promoting sweating. In biomedicine, this is called diaphoresis, or we could say these herbs have a diaphoretic action. So by inducing sweating, we're able to push the pathogen out of the body. And we can do this because the pathogen is still at the surface. If the pathogen were deeper in the body, we would have to employ other strategies like draining or purging. So how do we know that there's a pathogen on the exterior? What kind of evidence or what signs and symptoms are we going to see to let us know that there's an exterior attack? Well, the two main ones are number one, fever and chills, and number two, a floating pulse. So we can just say fever and chills, or we can use the Nigel Weissman terminology, heat effusion and aversion to cold or aversion to wind. The reason he says heat effusion is because what we're really referring to is the subjective feeling of heat as felt by the patient. So we don't really care what the number on the thermometer is, what we're really interested in is, does the patient feel feverish? Then he says aversion to cold or aversion to wind, because this is a literal translation of the Chinese, Wu Han and Wu Feng. So the idea here is, even though the patient feels warm and feverish, they still like to stay covered or bundled up because even slight exposure to a cold draft will cause them to feel chilled. So if you want to be technical, you can say heat effusion and aversion to cold, or if you want to just sound like a normal person, you can say fever and chills. And we should also emphasize here that we're talking about simultaneous fever and chills. Alternating fever and chills is something we'll talk about later with Shaoyang disorder, which is half internal, half external. But with an external attack, the fever and chills are simultaneous. So what's happening here is, when the pathogen invades the body, there's a great battle that ensues between the good qi, or the upright qi of the body, and the evil qi that's invading from the outside. So the simultaneous fever and chills are a consequence of this battle. So besides fever and chills, we're also going to see a floating pulse. We can say a floating pulse or a superficial pulse. Doesn't really matter, these two words mean the same thing. They're just different translations of the Chinese fu mai. The idea here is the pathogen is on the exterior, near the surface, so you feel the pulse, near the surface. So anytime you see these two symptoms, fever and chills and a floating pulse, that's a pretty good sign that we're dealing with an external attack. We generally divide external attacks into two categories, wind heat and wind cold. With wind cold, in addition to fever and chills and a floating pulse, we might see things like headache, stiff neck, and body ache. There might be nasal congestion or thin white phlegm. Now wind heat is still going to present with fever and chills, it's just going to be more fever and less chills. And the pulse is still going to be floating, indicating the pathogen is on the exterior. One of the major differentiating factors is going to be a red, swollen, sore throat. If there's phlegm, it's going to be thick, yellow, and difficult to expectorate. And wind heat can also present with eye problems like red itchy eyes or certain skin problems like rash. We'll talk more about wind heat in the next category, so let's get back to wind cold. In terms of the Shang Han Lun and the six levels, an exterior attack of wind cold is associated with the Tai Yang level. The Tai Yang channel governs the exterior of the body, so it's the first to get hit by an exterior attack. When we say Tai Yang, we mean the UB and SI channels, so that's why we see things like headache and stiff neck, because these two channels go to the head and neck. Now, Tai Yang disease can be further subdivided into two types, excess and deficiency. The key symptom that differentiates them is the presence of sweating or the absence of sweating. So Tai Yang excess presents with a lack of sweating. The idea here is there's an excess cold pathogen blocking the pores, so the sweat can't get out. This pattern of Tai Yang excess is also called Shang Han, or cold damage. Tai Yang deficiency, on the other hand, is characterized by the presence of sweating. Here there's a disharmony of the yin and the wei, meaning the exterior is deficient, it's unable to contain the sweat, so the sweat leaks out. 
but it does so in a way that's insufficient to expel the pathogen. So Taiyang deficiency has the presence of sweating, and it's also called zhong feng, or wind strike. So our two major herbs for these patterns are ma huang and gui zhi. Ma huang treats Taiyang excess, also known as shang han, or cold damage, which is fever and chills without sweating. Gui zhi treats Taiyang deficiency, also known as zhong feng, or wind strike, and it's characterized by fever and chills with sweating. So talking about the category warm acrid herbs that release the exterior, some common characteristics of these herbs, like the name suggests, they're going to be warm and acrid. Warm because we're treating wind-cold conditions, and acrid because the acrid flavor disperses the pathogen. As far as entering channels go, most of these herbs enter the lung channel, because the lung governs the exterior and the wei qi and the opening and closing of the pores. Cautions we want to pay attention to? These herbs are warm, acrid, and drying, so we use caution in cases of yin deficiency. Also, these herbs are very dispersing, so we use caution with debilitated patients or patients with qi deficiency. Now, that doesn't mean that these herbs are necessarily contraindicated. We'll just want to keep that in mind, that we might need to modify the formula to add tonifying or moistening herbs, and we'll want to be careful not to use these herbs long term. So let's go ahead and get into the individual herbs. First is ma huang, a fedra herba. It has three main functions. It promotes sweating to release the exterior, it stops cough and wheezing, and it promotes urination to treat edema. Ma huang is one of our best herbs for opening the pores and releasing the exterior, and it's the representative herb for tai yang excess pattern, that is, fever and chills without sweating. Ma huang also disseminates lung qi to stop cough and wheezing. Now the active ingredient in this herb is ephedrine, which we can now make into a synthetic form called pseudoephedrine, or pseudofed. So basically, ma huang is so good at stopping cough and wheeze that we even use it in western medicine for asthma and allergy relief. And finally, ma huang promotes urination to treat edema. But we have to be careful here, because when we say ma huang treats edema, we're pretty much talking about upper body edema, usually edema in the face, or acute edema that happens during the course of an external attack. So if a patient has long-standing edema in the legs due to kidney yang deficiency, it's unlikely that we would use ma huang for this condition. Ma huang enters the lung channel, so it's used for fluid accumulation in the upper jowl. As far as entering channels go, ma huang enters the lung and UB channels, which makes sense. Ma huang releases the exterior, and both the lung channel and the UB channel relate to the exterior. The lung channel controls the opening and closing of the pores, and the UB is part of the Ta Yang channel, the most exterior channel. Also, Ma Huang is good for cough and wheeze, so it enters the lung channel, and Ma Huang promotes urination, so it enters the UB channel. The name of this herb, Ma, means hemp, like Huo Ma Ren, and Huang means yellow, like the Huang Di Nei Jing, so Ma Huang means hemp yellow. Next is Gui Zhi, Cinnamomy Ramulus, or cinnamon twig. This herb releases the exterior, and it's the representative herb for Tai Yang deficiency, or fever and chills, with sweating. With Gui Zhi, when we say it releases the exterior, we specifically say it releases the muscle layer. This is implying that the pathogen is at a slightly deeper level than what we would see with Ma Huang. In this situation, we're more likely to see signs like stiff neck, body ache, and muscle soreness, because that's where the pathogen is, in the muscle layer. Besides releasing the muscle layer, Gui Zhi, Cinnamomy Ramulus, has a strong function of warming and unblocking the Yang Qi of various parts in the body. It can warm the heart and unblock the Yang Qi of the chest, treating chest B and palpitation. It can warm the middle jiao, treating abdominal pain due to coldness, as in the formula Xiao Jian Zhong Tong. It can warm the UB, treating urinary retention, as in the formula Wu Ling Song. It can warm the channels to treat B syndrome due to cold. It can also treat certain conditions of blood stagnation due to cold. Now here we don't really say that Gui Zhi invigorates blood, but due to its warming yang nature, it can warm the vessels and help with blood stagnation caused by coldness. Gui Zhi enters the lung channel because it releases the exterior, it enters the heart channel because it warms the chest, and it enters the UB channel because it warms the UB. Now you would think Guajir would enter the spleen channel as well, because it warms the middle jowl, and because it releases the muscle layer, and the muscles and flesh are governed by the spleen. But for some reason, we don't say that Guajir enters the spleen channel. 
We do, however, say that guajir is sweet in flavor, and remember the sweet flavor is associated with earth, which is in turn associated with the middle jowl and the muscles and flesh. So maybe that's how we can think of the flavors. Guajir is acrid because it releases the exterior, and even though guajir doesn't really have any tonifying action, we call it sweet because it treats a pattern of ta yang deficiency and because it goes to the muscle layer and the spleen. The jur in guajir means twig, so guajir really just translates to cinnamon twig. And lastly, we can say that ma huang and guajir are very often used together as a dui yao pair. If we wanted to compare them, we could say that ma huang is better at opening the pores and inducing sweating, but guajir is actually warmer in temperature. Ma huang works at a slightly more superficial level to release pathogens right under the skin, while guajir works at a slightly deeper level, releasing pathogens from the muscle layer. For taiyang excess, we use ma huang, ephedra herba, to strongly induce sweating and push the pathogen out. For taiyang deficiency, we use guajir, cinnamomiramulus, to harmonize the yin in the way. So that was wind cold, which was our first category of herbs that release the exterior. Now let's talk about wind heat. So how is an exterior attack of wind heat going to present differently? Well, it's still an external attack, so we're still going to see fever and chills, just now it's going to be more fever and less chills. And it's still an exterior attack, so we're still going to see a floating pulse, just now the pulse might be floating and rapid because heat speeds things up. And then, the main differentiating factor between wind heat and wind cold is going to be sore throat. Wind heat will likely present with a red, sore, swollen, painful throat. So along with more fever, less chills, and a rapid pulse, sore throat is going to be our key symptom to look for. Wind heat on the exterior can also present with rash, so some of the herbs in this category have an action of venting rashes. This is especially useful for early stage rash, when the rash hasn't completely expressed itself. So these herbs can bring the rash to the surface and vent it outwards, allowing for a faster recovery. Some of these wind heat herbs also treat certain eye problems. We say they brighten the eyes. When it comes to external attacks, historically we have two different schools of thought. One is the cold damage school, which follows the Shang Han Lun by Zhong Zhong Jing. This theory says that cold pathogens penetrate the body through the six channels, Ta Yang, Yang Ming, Shao Yang, and so on. The other is the Wen Bing school, or the warm disease theory, which started with the Wen Zhe Lun, written by Yi Tian Shi. This theory says that heat pathogens penetrate the body through the four levels, the Wei level, Qi level, Ying level, and Shui level. So in terms of Chinese medical theory, when we have a wind cold attack on the exterior, we call that Tai Yang disease, according to the Shang Han Lun. Or, when we have an attack of wind heat on the exterior, we call it Wei level heat, according to Wen Bing theory. So that's just another way of saying it. Herbs in the category cool acrid herbs that release the exterior are for treating Wei level heat, according to Wen Bing theory. Again, these herbs are going to be cool and acrid, and they're going to tend to enter the lung channel. They're very dispersing, so we want to use caution in cases of qi deficiency. Our first herb is Bo He, Mentha haplocalcus herba. Bo He. Bo He is mint leaf. It releases exterior wind heat. Since it's light and ascending, it's especially useful for clearing the head, eyes, and throat. So when we have a wind heat invasion with headache, red eyes, or sore throat, Bo He is an excellent herb to use. In releasing the exterior, Buohu also vents rashes, especially for early stage rashes like measles. Buohu can induce the rash to come to the surface and vent it outwards. Besides releasing the exterior, Buohu also has an action of gently moving liver qi, treating liver qi stagnation. Now Buohu is never used as a chief herb for this purpose, but we still see it used alongside other liver qi moving herbs, like in the formula Xiaoyaosan. As for the properties of Buohu, besides being cool and acrid, it's also aromatic. This aromatic quality allows it to ascend upwards and unblock the orifices of the head and face. But it also means that we have to follow a special cooking instruction when preparing Buohu in decoction. Buohu should be added during the last five minutes of cooking, since cooking it too long will destroy those aromatic properties. So this is something we need to tell our patients when we prescribe Buohu in raw form, and it's also just a question that comes up on a lot of tests. So remember, Buohu is added at the end of the cooking process. 
The dosage of Buohe is slightly smaller than average, 3 to 6 grams, just because it's a light herb. If you use the normal 9 grams, your pot would just be overflowing with all the mint, and there wouldn't be room for anything else. The entering channels, Buohe enters the lung and liver channels. It enters the lung because it releases the exterior, and also because it vents skin rashes, and the lung governs the skin. Then it also enters the liver channel, both because it clears wind heat to brighten the eyes, and because it gently moves liver chi. So maybe you can remember that mint leaf is green in color, and green is the color of the liver. So those are the herbs in the category herbs that release the exterior. Hope you enjoyed it, because that's all for today. Thanks, and see you next time.